Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our second week of our masterclasses for the HSC for Studies of Religion. And today we'll be looking at Judaism and significant practice being marriage. And just a very, very warm welcome. In this next hour or so, we'll be really concentrating on looking at the actual ritual and its link to its beliefs of Judaism and also to the significance and meaning for the community and certainly for the individuals. If you have a question to ask, if I could ask you to put it into the Q&A or into chat and we will then answer questions towards the last five to ten minutes of this session. So today's practice is Judaism in is marriage in Judaism. And I'm Kathy Brown. I'm the secondary ed officer here in Sydney Catholic Schools of one of a team with the Mission and Identity Directorate. Just as a starting point there, it's really nice to look at some quotes and references from scripture, but also from um, significant people in Judaism, particularly rabbis, but also some rabbis too, who also teach um, everything about the Torah. And you'll also have people who are Jewish adherents, who actually will write books and write articles about marriage. And it's often nice to have those as references to support your answers in whatever you may do. So on the front there, it's Jewish marriage is not merely a secular legal partnership, but a, but a union sanctified for God, by God. And God is also saying to the Jewish adherents that it's not good for men to be alone, and that's certainly in Genesis. And also we see that Jewish marriage is integral to God's plan of ongoing creation. Marriage not only provides individual companionship, but it also ensures the physical and spiritual survival of humanity by creating communities that reflect divine law. So some of those um, references there are really significant for your own understanding of Jewish marriage. And on that first um, screen there, or first slide, we have a few symbols and symbolism is incredibly rich in marriage for our Jewish adherents. So some food for thought when we're looking at, um, at Jewish marriage, particularly for its Jewish adherents, regardless of their stream. So Judaism considers marriage to be humanity's ideal state. And you would have learnt this while studying Judaism. Any person without a spouse is considered to be incomplete. Where do we find the, this information? From the Talmud, which has got the Mishnah and Jamara in there, which, is, which are both very, very rich. And also we find people like Maimonides have responded to the, um, to the Talmud by codifying law or recodifying law and actually writing something like the Mishnah Torah where there's more information for adherents of Judaism. However, in today's world, they'd be looking at what their rabbis are telling them and saying to them. They'd also be looking at what uh, responsa exists over time to support them in whatever decisions they make with marriage. From the Babylonian Talmud there, 62b, we have when a man is without a wife, he lives without joy, without blessing, without good. So the significance for the person, for the man, and we would say now for progressive Judaism as well, it would be for both genders. We're hearing that you don't have joy, you don't have blessing, you don't have good without having that partner who you walk through life with. And then from the Babylonian Talmud, we also have a quote saying, a man must love his wife at least as much as himself, but honour her more than himself. So those statements are significantly important. And even at bar mitzvahs and brit millars, okay, so brit millars 
uh, when the male child, male baby, is circumcised at eight days of age, and that's a ceremony that goes with it. And bar mitzvahs, when the young male becomes almost an adult in, in Jewish life, there is a blessing of three things, Torah, which is significantly important, good deeds and hapa. So from that point of view, we're hearing that marriage is significantly important for our young people from the moment that they are born right through their lives and recognised in ceremonies like the bar mitzvahs and brit milahs as well. But what about the streams? To successfully do well in your trial exam and your HSC in either section two or three when you have a question or a series of questions in section two on the practice of marriage, you need to be able to weave streams throughout your answers. And in Australia at this moment, we are looking at three streams of Judaism or three broad streams. You're orthodox and there's just a little bit of a definition for each one there. The written and oral, oral Torah are divinely, are the divinely revealed word of God and cannot be altered. So if I'm an orthodox Jew, I cannot change whatever the Torah, both written and oral, have spoken to me about as far as marriage is concerned. And halakha is authoritative and binding. So if I am orthodox and being married in uh, the Jewish tradition, I am really adhering to the laws of Judaism and the real written law and oral law. So both the Torah and the Talmud become incredibly important. When I look at conservative Judaism, the oral Torah is not the actual revealed word of God. The halakha is authoritative, but not necessarily binding. But the law and history are important. So I'm kind of taking a step with a little bit more flexibility. I would be guided by law and history. So 613 mitzvot come in consideration. I also look at historically what has happened with marriage over time. And certainly progressive Judaism, which is more what's experienced in our, in our context today in Australia. And it basically emphasises autonomy. This is where in Judaism, the person gets to live, the adherent gets to live a life that is very dynamic and, and and to their needs. So the halakha is still referred to as a source of guidance, but really we're looking at the progressive Jew being able to emphasize their own autonomy in how they would practice um, anything leading to marriage, but particularly their faith. So the three streams with progressive being and conservative being the most practiced in Australia and orthodox in particular communities um, need to be addressed where we look at marriage having so many opportunities for um, interpretations and lived out traditions to suit the individual in their lives. Throughout this presentation, I have taken a bit of a personal aspect to it. My niece, who is pictured here, um, married, was Catholic and married a, a conservative to progressive Jew. And his name's Yoni and her name's Samantha. And they were married in 2017. And uh, their, their pictures will appear during this presentation with their okay that I've been able to do this. And it becomes a very personal thing when you've been part of a Jewish marriage. And certainly I and my family have been fortunate enough to do that. My father was Jewish. My brother has married a Jewish woman and certainly Samantha has married a Jewish um, man. And with Judaism being a matriarchal religion or tradition, certainly their children, which they have two, a boy and a girl, the perfect um, combination for Judaism, um, 
that gives them an opportunity to to live their lives accordingly and samantha's matriarchal stance on that means that those children are automatically jewish so our learning intention for today is to understand the richness of each step of the Jewish marriage for adherence and all the streams of Judaism. So we're looking at the meaning of each of the steps and, and the symbolism that goes with them. And we're also looking at the link to the beliefs and the significance for the individual and community. So at the conclusion of this presentation, you should be able to provide features of a Jewish marriage outlining the symbolism of each specific part and we should be able to or you should be able to identify how three beliefs of Judaism relate to each step or part of the practice of marriage. You should be able to make a judgment about the significance of Jewish marriage for both the individual and the community. In going back there, that's a beautiful quote there where we look at Jewish wedding traditions tend to keep the couple, the kala and shatan, grounded and focused on the commitment that they're about to make to each other and to God, not on just the frivolity surrounding the ceremony itself. So it's really important for the bride and the groom which we need to in our answers, always refer to them as the kala and shatan. Um, for them, they're really, really knowing whichever, whichever stream they're in, they know that God is that silent partner in their marriage and in their preparation for it as well. Just a syllabus, quick syllabus recap, and you know your syllabus very, very well. We always hope that we operate on the right hand side of the syllabus where you're looking at describing one significant practice within Judaism, which is related to marriage. And when we're looking at describe, you know your verbs providing the main features of, but we need to describe the ritual of marriage, the actual symbolism and the steps of, of the marriage itself or the stages. You also need to demonstrate how this practice expresses the beliefs of Judaism. So when we're looking at the, the um, beliefs of Judaism, we know that there's going to be crystal clear clarity around how the ritual, the elements of marriage expresses the three beliefs of Judaism, which you should have ingrained in your own self and know off by heart and understand incredibly well, absolutely. So, um, and we need to also see how those beliefs are present in a marriage. And thirdly, you need to analyze the significance of this practice for both the individual and the Jewish community. So we're looking at a double whammy there, both for the individuals, the kala and the shatan, the bride and the groom, and the community for everybody who starts with them in preparing for Jewish marriage, who are actually at the Jewish marriage ceremony and celebration, and certainly for the week or so afterwards, which then continues into a lifetime. So we need to look at the relationships to analyze which exist between the elements of the ritual, the beliefs and the significance that they have for the individual, the experience and the community, the experience and the theology. The syllabus outcomes are incredibly important. You cannot ignore them because in all honesty, they shape the paper, both your trial paper and the HSC exam. So it's always a good practice to go back to the outcomes and have a look at which ones are going to be impacting on the writing of an exam paper for both the trial and the HSC and how that actually impacts on you. So do not ignore them, okay? They shape the paper, so have your knowledge ready to go as far as papers are concerned. Make sure you read and deconstruct the questions, identify the verbs, identify the source-based material and have a real good look at it and put the links there and really communicate succinctly and clearly. 
So you've got H1, explain the aspects of religion and belief systems. So you've learnt so much of that last year in Year 11. So it's really bringing it into this more mature way of looking at marriage in Year 12. You need to be able to describe and analyse the influence of religion. So it's basically looking at how does how does Judaism, how does the concept of marriage and everything that happens in it, how does that really influence people and how they actually live their lives to make it that dynamic living tradition? H4 is looking at describing, which is a nice verb, analysing a little bit more difficult, how the aspects of religious traditions are expressed by their adherents. So it's really important that those aspects are expressed differently as a result of the streams. Please be aware that you need to use the word streams, denominations are Christianity, um, variances used to be Judaism, but in today's time right now while you're doing your HSC year, you're looking at streams. H5, that you can evaluate the influence of religious traditions in the life of adherence. So what difference does it make? How, how how Judaism is lived so that then a person, when they get married, will adopt however they may do things in a ritual that has got nine to ten steps, depending which way you look at it, and each step has incredible significance for the individual and the community and also highlights the beliefs of Judaism in a very beautiful way. HA, you need to have your terminology. So once you have said bride and groom, you need to then refer to them as kala and shatan. Once you describe the two steps of a Jewish marriage, you need to refer to them as irisen and yusen. So in your answers, you need to show the marker that you can use Hebrew words as well as, of course, your English counterparts. And also H9, you need to coherently and effectively communicate your complex info, ideas, and need to do that well. And if you have a source-based material quote in your actual question, that you weave that through the answer as well. You cannot just hang it there somewhere in your answer. It needs to be really, really looked at and utilised. Just a few tips. I thought this would be a good idea for you to just rethink things and get clarity around this. When revising for your trial and HSC paper, remember the three W's for your audit of your knowledge. So do an audit of what you know. And if there's areas that you think I'm a little bit low on my knowledge, you need to check in and make sure that you touch base with your teacher and experience extra information as well. So. The three W's for Jewish marriage. Why would a Jewish adherent get married? Answer it. Why would, why would a Jewish adherent want to get married? And we know from Genesis, go forth and multiply. We know that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. And in that rest on the seventh day is a real connection to family. And family is the cornerstone of a Jewish marriage. And God is always present as that third person in that marriage. So they're fulfilling, fulfilling a covenant basically that was made with the patriarchs and throughout history and certainly with Moses at Mount Sinai. But also a Jewish adherent will get married for love and for companionship and to have children and to have children in Judaism is seen as incredibly precious and incredibly important because then the succession of that tradition continues. So it's incredibly important to get married in Judaism. Who, who marries a couple and how is it done? So you're looking at the ritual of how it is done, so the steps of a marriage and the symbolism. But you're also looking at the importance of the rabbi and the importance of the adherence to so in there, I maybe could have added how important is the adherent there as well, because we know in today's world, depending on the stream of Judaism, different marriages will occur. 
And there are different rabbis. Rabbis and synagogues have different viewpoints on marriage as well to allow people to be able to marry and be with a person in their lives and enjoy that companionship and love. And what is the significance of marriage for the individual, the couple and the community in attendance at the ceremony? So how important is it for an individual to be married, both the kala and the shatan, or the male and the female? What about the couple as it is? And then also the community who form a lifelong connection to that couple. And Judaism basically, um, just through its laws and beliefs, provides the groundwork for that to happen. And really know your year 11 content well. Your three beliefs and how to apply them to marriage, need you need to have a thorough understanding of them. Scripture and sacred text passages, both the Torah and the Talmud, you need to have references plus a significant Jewish person or two who have taught about marriage, an appropriate response over time. So Jew, Jewish marriage has not changed so much for our Orthodox adherents, but certainly it still hasn't changed for progressive and conservative as well. But again, reminding you that progressive have an opportunity to then tailor make their ceremony according to their needs and their beliefs as well, and how they live their lives as Jewish adherents. And in saying that, if you were to get a question in section three, which is a 20 marker, that is a holistic question or integrated question, it may be if it's an integrated where you can bring someone like, if you have studied Maimonides and you're looking at his Mishnah Torah as a base for laws and rules on Jewish marriage, because the Talmud really outlines clearly the process of being married. So Maimonides played with that in the most, with most respect, I use that word, and, um, and changed it so that people could, not changed it, but adapted it so it could help people to understand how to live their faith or their tradition in an easier way at their time. And certainly other people have then extended upon Maimonides' work as well over the generations. And you even have to know how the observance of Shabbat can be tied in with marriage if marriage provides the background for the cornerstone of living a Jewish life, being marriage for the appropriation of then children, um, Shabbat comes into that as a practice where the family work together to acknowledge that observance and live it from Friday sunset to Saturday sundown. So bringing Shabbat in there, even though it is an year 11 learning, um, is, is part of a family's life and marriage is the start of that family's life. So revising for your trial and HSC paper, remember the three Fs for practice. It just makes it a little bit simple to remember when you're shaping up and doing practice questions, but also for your own knowledge too, and doing an audit of your knowledge. So form, you need to be able to define marriage. You need to look at symbols and symbolism. You need to look at the steps of the ceremony and the before and after the ceremony too. In Judaism, um, in getting married, there's important, um, I suppose, elements that happen before the marriage ceremony and also for after. So we need to know those. And then how do streams live their faith through the practice of marriage? So how is progressive, re, um, conservative and progressive adherents living their lives through marriage according to how they interpret their faith. Second F is faith. So there's always got to have to be a link between the beliefs of the tradition. And we know the three beliefs for Judaism is are the belief in one God and the attributes of God, the concept of a divinely inspired moral law and the importance of covenant for Jewish people. 
And the third F is function. What is the significance? Because of getting married, what is the significance to the individual and to the community? And if we're stuck when we're looking at significance in writing answers or writing revision notes, getting ready for your trial and the actual HSC, significance really means what is the meaning of, of marriage for the couple, for the individual, the couple and the community, the importance of it, the weight of it, what does it mean, the implication of being married okay, for the community and the individual, the consequences and magnitude. So those words are really nice words to look at when you're looking at the significance of the individual and significance to the community. It's very hard to take the couple away from here too because they're an individual as they get married, but they really become known as that couple in the Jewish community. So when we're looking at the actual ceremony, okay, you've got to know it well. It contains so much meaning and symbolism, and it's very rich in symbolism. And whatever this dream has the presence of three people always in a newly formed relationship. You've heard me say it a few times now. It has the Kala, the Shatan, and God. So the bride, the groom, and God. God is that silent partner in their marriage. And that's very important to remember. And in Judaism, I'm sure you've heard it now by this stage of your stage six course, you always hear the statement that Jews will say, on this hand, we would do it this way, but then on the other hand, we would do it this other way. So in its true form, much happens before the actual marriage. And it's also, I suppose, adapted and adopted for each individual as they prepare for their marriage in Judaism. Down the bottom there um, of this slide, you can see significant symbols. So I will go through them with you, which really then support um, the adherents as they, as they prepare for the wedding or the marriage. So the first one that we want to really look at is the Afraf, and you would have uh, looked at the Afraf in your studies, okay, but it's actually called a calling up. In the wedding where my niece was married, I was very lucky, apart from the bridal party, I was very lucky to attend the Emmanuel Synagogue for her calling up and her partner Yoni's calling up. And uh, they actually have a blessing which is called the Alia. And at that calling up, both Yoni and Samantha read from the Torah. But Yoni did not read from the Torah. He chose his passage from the Torah and he knew it off by heart from studying for many, many years. So for him, he was seen as it's quite wonderful for the future um, Shatan to be able to do that incredibly well with meaning. And accompanying them was the rabbi as well. So he joined them, the bridal party joined them, and I was just a person who was lucky enough with the relationships there and with my daughter being a bridesmaid, being part of that too. There now, Samantha read from the Torah as well. So in progressive Judaism, um, the Afraf or, and then the Aliyah and the reading from the Torah um, is mostly done by both the male and the female. But in an orthodox um, stream, you would find that, and conservatives as well, you would find very much that it's being done by the male only. The rabbi would work with them to be able to know which passage they would read from the Torah, uh, the significance of it and what it means to them as well. So there's a lot that goes into the calling up of uh, all the afraf before the wedding, before the actual marriage. And that occurs a week before. And it's normally uh, on the at Shabbat, so it would be on a Saturday morning in the synagogue, and it would be quite a number of people in the synagogue, including those boys who are making their bar mitzvahs as well. 
When the blessing is completed, the entire congregation wishes them luck and happiness by throwing soft candies at them. In the progressive um, afraf or calling up, certainly they weren't throwing candies at. So, um, but it's something that maybe the orthodox would do and conservative in some areas. You know, the mikvah is very important when we're looking at purity. So the week also leading up to the marriage ceremony, the uh, bride or the kala would experience a mikvah, a purity bath. And these are found in, in some homes, in Jewish homes, in there's public mikvahs as well um, for the streams of Judaism. And the bride, the kala, would experience this probably around four days before the actual ceremony. And it's very, very important. And during the mikvah, there's a blessing for the kala as well. And I've actually put it in there where it's stated, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us concerning the immersion. So when we're looking at divine inspired moral law as one of the beliefs of Judaism, that's definitely a recognition in this blessing when we're looking at the commandments. And the commandments would be acknowledged, not just the Ten Commandments, we're looking at the, the mitzvot, the, the 613, specifically those aligned to marriage as well. Um, in progressive Judaism, we have many shatans who will also experience a mikvah as well in male dominated mikvah venues. So, um, and women we know will always have mikvahs after they have given birth to a baby, but also a purity period after they have finished their period. So there's a real interesting and important aspect of the mikvah when we're looking at purity. Okay, so that person is clean, ready to be received um, into a different state compared to being single. And of course, um, the third really, really important one to look at before the, the actual marriage ceremony is the fact that the day of the wedding or the marriage is seen to be like a personal Yom Kippur. Okay, and there's a little bit of information there which tells us what the Yom Kippur is about. It's, it's very significant in a Jewish adherence life where it's a day of atonement, a day of, um, of sins being forgiven, sins being recognised and forgiven and starting over again. So both the Shatan and the Kala on the day of the marriage or their wedding ceremony are both experiencing a personal Yom Kippur where everything is forgiven on that day. They are considered like a king and a queen and they fast. They fast um, from the morning of the, the ceremony till the actual end of the ceremony. And a lot of them will fast from the day before at dinner all the way through to the end of the actual ceremony. So it's really, really important to remember because Yom Kippur is around forgiveness and, a, and, and I love that it's considered to be a day of spiritual inventory and repentance. That is exactly what's happening for the couple who are getting married. So let's have a look at a Jewish marriage and look at how it's linked to meanings, okay, importantly, and making meanings, the symbols, and also the beliefs. So when we're looking at the first part, the Bedeccan, okay, the Bedeccan is the veiling. And we know there's a real historical background to that with the patriarchs, looking at Rebecca and Isaac, where Rebecca, as she was moving towards Isaac to be married, she veiled herself. And we've got a quote there from um, Genesis as well, scripture passage. And then we look at Jacob, and who follows on from the patriarchs there, and the deceiving way of Laban 
and what he did so that then Jacob worked for him so that he could marry who he wanted to marry, being Rachel, and instead ended up marrying Leah. And in that story, um, Leah had her veil over her, so he was confused. He did not know that he married the wrong sister. And there's a real story behind that. But as a result of Jacob, we do have the 12 tribes of Israel. He had six children with Leah. And as a result of that, the again, the tribes of Israel were perpetuated as a result of the children and their connection through marriage. So when we're looking at the veiling, it's incredibly important. And what would normally happen is that the veiling would support the modesty and the soul and the character of the bride, the colour. And it would be really interesting to look at the fact that the groom, the shatan, is veiling her, but he looks at her first and appreciates her beauty, not just the physical, but also looking at her, her soul and her character and veils her to know that that is the person who he's appreciative of, he's going to care for and care with and look after. It affirms her, it affirms her privacy, her self-worth, and their scriptural richness from where the veiling had its origins. After she is veiled by the shatan, um, the, the shatan then leaves, but her father gives her a blessing as well. And she's very much appreciative of all of this. And in this situation, you see Samantha um, with, its, with the family, bridesmaids and groomsmen, the rabbi, and also my brother is in that photo as well, and his wife, and Yoni is veiling Samantha. And sorry, I'm just going back to at the very start of the ceremony, and we haven't got to the ceremony exactly yet, but before it, there is that community sense, okay? It's not just Yoni and Samantha doing that. It is the rabbi as well. It's the parents of the bride and the groom, the shatan and the kala. And it's also the people who are going to support them, their bridesmaids and groomsmen. And they understand it as well. They learn about the process of what the Bedeckin's about. The second one is the procession, and this is where the first part of the marriage ceremony occurs, which is called the Urusan. And that is where the groom, the shatan, makes his way down to the hapa or the canopy. And the canopy or hapa, and please remember to use hapa and of course refer to it once as canopy as well, um, has its groundings in Sarah and Isaac. Um, Sarah and Isaac always had their tent open for the community, for hospitality. They were always um, supportive of others, of the community. So the hapa is, uh, doesn't have walls, okay, it's supported by four poles um, and it's, it's done differently depending on the stream of Judaism, but it is a symbol of the home. It's open on all sides. Or everybody can see in, which is kind of like what marriage is going to be like for the specific people who've attended the wedding that day. The family's right there, the community, and um, and there can be a an ability in some situations where we see, particularly in progressive Judaism, um, important people aligned to the Shatan and Kala who actually hold the poles um, of the actual hapa, the base of the hapa. And, um, and that's significantly important. Those people during that ceremony would never forget um, being those supports, both physically, but also emotionally through the remainder of that marriage. And it also demonstrates unconditional um, hospitality as well. And look at the stream diversity here. So it's quite interesting where you have 
um, firstly, on, on the left there, um, a young couple having been married, they're under the hapa, and you can see that it's outside. You can see that uh, it's made with uh, the elements that it's been made with and simple cloth over the top and looking at um, greenery as well. And then we go to the right hand side where we have a female rabbi marrying the couple under the hapa. Okay, and the prayer shawl forms the top of the of the hapa as well. And then of course in the middle we have a very traditional or progressive hapa there within a synagogue. So um, we have some reception places which primarily have got as a base their own huppers and it's done quite beautifully. And the meal afterwards is in a different kind of room. So there's real stream diversity even where the two adherents, the couple will get married as well. The third step is looking at the circling of the shatan. So this is the kala circling the shatan. And it's really important to remember depending again on the stream. So I think throughout this presentation, you're realizing how important streams are in understanding how a Jewish marriage is, is done, okay? And how it's celebrated. So um, the individuals decide whether or not they circle, whether or not the kala circles the shatan three or seven times. And it's related to the individual needs, the stream, the philosophies of Judaism being observed, the philosophies of the individual. And it is in the Torah, it is written seven times when a man takes a, a wife, which is quite interesting. So the seven there has got some symbolism there. And there's just a little quote down there too, um, which I think is really, really important for looking at what will happen um, for that, that new wife and new husband. So have a look at that when you have a chance and when your teacher can go through this with you as well. But when we're looking at what's the symbolism of seven or three, okay? For three, a lot of progressive Jews will say there's a male in this relationship, the female in the relationship, and God in the relationship. Um, for some of them, they will also say that they're really, really looking at the world created in seven days. They're looking at the walls of the couple's new world together. They're looking at wholeness and completion. The history of the walls of Jericho and Joshua and the Jews breaking down the walls and them disintegrating has the symbolism that any walls which exist are broken down at that time. And that was that's really, really important. And there's always the presence of God. So the, there's no walls. Um, the walls are gone. So that circling of um, the shatan by the colour is incredibly important. And um, I'm just thinking if there's anything that we need to add to that, but it is really very, very important. What I was going to say in Australia at this moment with progressive Judaism, seven times has been really, really recognised more than three times. So it seems that this symbolism of seven is incredibly important. And there's so much symbolism. You have a bride there, or I should say a kala, um, circling her shatan, okay? And certainly you can see that the groomsmen are there um, supporting supporting that, that marriage ceremony. So the community look on, the individuals are benefiting from this part of the, the ritual. And adherents are able to determine how to do this with their rabbi being the person who will guide them in how to live out their faith for this important part of the ritual. When we look at the fourth step of a marriage, okay, we're looking at the blessings. And the, there's a few points when we're looking at this. The blessings of betrothal are called the Kaddishwan. And during this blessings of betrothal, it ha happens twice, that the couple will take a drink of wine or have a cup of wine. The first one is used now while the blessings are being um, celebrated. And um, the rabbi actually is saying the blessings. It's rare not to see a rabbi sing the actual whole ceremony in Hebrew. 
which is quite beautiful. So that's something to think about as well when we're looking at rabbis and how they work with the couple getting married. So many couples will actually um, have a background of Hebrew and really try and understand it so that they make sense of their wedding ceremony as well. Wine is a symbol of joy and God's created man and woman with joy. So that sort of covenant in God and his power, his omnipotent, omnipresent, all the time he's in that person's life. And marriage is the sanctification of a man and a woman to each other. And you've got that beautiful quote from Genesis where a man should therefore leave his father and mother and be united with his wife and they become one. The fifth um, step of a Jewish marriage is looking at the giving of the ring by the shatan, okay? So everyone who marries, marries in accordance with the rabbinic understanding of the law. So law, divinely inspired law is very important. And as I said earlier, in the Talmud, there's an excellent explanation of how a Jewish marriage is participated in and conducted. But the rabbis play a significant role in the fruition of that law being acknowledged through the shatan and the kala and the family. Um, it's according to the law of Moses in Israel. Okay, it's based in the Torah as well when we're looking at the mitzvot too. And it, this is a real central moment of the wedding ceremony because we're almost saying in this step of the, the marriage that the couple are married and it's an everlasting marriage. And when we're looking at the link with meanings and beliefs, okay, the um, Kala is given her ring on her index finger of the right hand. And there's huge symbolism there. A Jewish child is taught to read the Torah using their right hand's index finger. So there's real significance there. And normally after the ceremony, it stays on on the index finger of the right hand. It is then changed over to, to the traditional secular way that we have the ring on our left finger and of our left, sorry, our left hand. So that happens after in um, the olden days and certainly in Orthodox as well. Um, well, not so much Orthodox, could be conservative now You may and progressive. You would have um, both, both the male and the female receiving a ring depending on the rabbi and also on how they do things um, in that particular stream. Um, in progressive, the male can certainly receive a ring too, but in some elements of that, you may find that the ring is given after the whole ceremony is finished to the male. So, and that that's makes sense because what the male does say is, behold, by this ring, you'll consecrate it to me as my wife, according to the laws of Moses and Israel. So it shows again that significance of Moses, the laws of Moses, the covenant God made with Moses, incredibly important. And there it is in Hebrew as well. And then the progressives tend to do a lot of engraving inside of wedding rings as well, where they use the Song of Solomon, okay, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine, which is quite beautiful. The Hebrew declaration that they'll say in English is called Hara A. With this ring you are sanctified to me as my spouse. And it contains 32 letters. In Hebrew, the number 32 is written with letters that spell the word heart. So just a real interesting thing when we're looking at the words that are used. The couple are then giving their hearts to each other as they recite these words. So it is quite beautiful. So again, the giving of the ring can be different in streams. And certainly now with gay marriage being accepted in the progressive um, stream, it's uh, very much seen that both people will receive a ring each as well and it extends the ceremony a little bit there as well. 
Number six is the reading of the ketubah, which is a marriage contract. So here we have a covenant, okay, an agreement coming through. This is a pure agreement. It's in Aramaic. It's read out loud. So that means the whole community hears what's in that that particular contract. Uh, so therefore, they're very, very bound to the couple. Has the standing of a legally binding agreement. It is the property of the colour. It's displayed in the home. Now, that's super important. So in all streams of Judaism, um, the ketubah is beautifully framed most of the time in today's time, 21st century, and it's put in a central place in the home. For my niece and her, part, and her husband, they actually have got it where you walk in to their home. So you can see it straight away and it's risen and it's just beautiful. It was incredibly beautifully made for them. Um, a lot of um, couples will find people who do it in Australia, but also will, will actually get their ketubah from overseas as well. And the actual um, ketubah, the reading of it, is actually the break that happens in a marriage ceremony between the Eruzin, the betrothal, and the Nusin, which is the actual marriage, okay? The binding, it is a binding document of trust and confidence, and it's signed by two witnesses before the actual ceremony. And those two witnesses become an incredible part of the new couple's life. And normally they look after the ketubah for the married, for the couple getting married at the actual ceremony. So it's very well looked after. It's very precious. Um, the shatan has a real responsibility to the kala through the ketubah, okay? He has to work for her, honour her and provide and support for her and make sure that their relationship is going well in all ways, including intimacy too. And now they're actually official. So the contract does this, just like the contract or the covenant between God and Moses, the covenant between him and, and the patriarchs of Judaism. The Ketubah text was also codified in the first century and a whole tractate of the Talmud describes its purpose and requirements. So it's really binding under Jewish law and is accompanied by civil wedding documents as well. So you can have, see there with so much meaning um, the ketubah itself held by the rabbi with the family looking on. So again, the community are with the couple the whole way through. So they become super significant in that couple's life. Um, you actually have got Samantha and Yoni who've signed it, but also you've got the witness um, being the, the third picture there at the bottom who's actually signing as well. Then the new sin commences with the seven blessings and I'm going to move through this really quickly. The second glass of wine is shared and sometimes in progressive ceremonies they will actually um, drink from the second glass and actually share it, pour some glass after they've had the second glass, pour a little bit of each glass into another glass and actually share that showing that they've really, really combined together. Um, and it's in honour of the Shatan and Kala, the seven blessings, the Sheva Brashot, and they're recited by the rabbi. It's always a need for a minion to exist, and a minion is your 10, ten adults, um, and that depends on the stream as well. In progressive Judaism, it doesn't have to be men, but in orthodox Judaism, a minion needs to exist to hear um, the seven blessings being uh, sung or said in this part of the wedding ceremony. And it's really, really important that the theme is the linking of the shatan and kala to the faith as in God, as creator, bestower, and also the ultimate redeemer. And I've included four blessings here, which probably for me seem to be beautiful and tie in with the beliefs of Judaism as well. When we're looking at the next part, it is the breaking of the glass. 
a few points about what happens there. The shatan breaks the glass, but how is it important and what's the symbolism? It looks, they often refer to the destruction of the temple. It marks the end of the ceremony. The Kalar and Shatan are now able to leave from the Hapa and are a new couple. The whole community has witnessed this. And when we think about a covenant, normally in Judaism with the with covenant, there's always a breaking of something. So think of like the Ten Commandments on the stones being broken. And then there has to be a reconnection to those Ten Commandments and, and then the oral Torah as well. So the symbolism is incredibly important. Um, the breaking of the glass connects the couple to the spiritual and national destiny of the Jewish people. So it's showing the end of the actual ceremony. But the couple also are aware of the fragility of their relationship and uh, know that the community is there to support them, but the community know they are there to support them. And I need you to check out the Talmud, uh, Berakot 5.2. It shows you the custom of the breaking of the glass, which is also now adjusted to include a light bulb. So the light bulb also has that extra thought that it is that light bulb moment that we are now a couple. We are now forming the cornerstone with our family of what is a Jewish life, a way of living. So that's incredibly important. And um, I suppose in the, there's also an acute awareness of destruction. So in the, in the marriage ceremony, um, the breaking of a glass is a little bit you know, destruct, destructive, but also there's a joyous situation there and there's also, you can't put that glass together. So they're reminded that healing is very, very important in their marriage to each other, to their children, to the community. And the presence of Tikkun alarm comes in there when you're looking at healing too. Almost when the couple get married on, on the day, um, they are seen as actually performing a mitzvot too and, and, and they're seen as being part of the healing for the community. And you can see um, the, the kala, uh, sorry, the shatan breaking the glass. In streams of Judaism, progressive, uh, depending on the rabbi, they will have two glasses there to break. Um, it would not be a light bulb in Orthodox Judaism. So, you know, there's variations there when you're looking at streams. And the ninth part and then the last part is looking at the Yitchard. Okay, the Yitchard is where the couple now break their fast. They have a new status. They have their Shoma and Shoma Ret, which is equivalent to a matron of honour and best man who have cared for them leading up to the wedding and who care for them afterwards as well. Um, sort of make sure they're okay to go to a room where they have their first time where they can break the fast, they can relax, they can have some time together, they can have um, some, some real good time as a newly formed couple um, in the Jewish tradition. And it's a mitzvah for the guests to bring simcha or joy to the shatan and colour on their wedding day. So when the meal follows, there's lots of music, lots of dancing and eating. There's grace after meals and the seven blessings are then uh, prayed or blessed again. And then for the whole week after the ceremony, the, com the community actually host festive meals for the newly married couple. And after every grace after meals, they recite the sheva a shot. So, and that brings in very much the beliefs of Judaism too. And it's called the week of Shavar Brashot. Um, here, Samantha and Yoni uh, did, do, did go to or, or experience Yichard. So actually had their time together, but they also had time then afterwards with their bridal party. Um, the dancing, certainly dancing is really important with family first and then of course the bridal party and then every other person. And of course there's Yoni as well and it's seen as incredibly important. And then of course the horror where they're put, um, raised on chairs and everybody appreciates them and, and, and admires the new couple as if they are a king and a queen for that day and certainly afterwards as well. So 
just to bring this together, just some important statements for you to remember and talk a little bit about. Family life is like a glue that holds Judaism together. All Jews are expected to marry and have at least two children and a boy and a girl are the ideal state in Judaism. Um, you bring those children up in, in the Jewish tradition and remembering that it is a matriarchal religion too. And it's important to be a, a, a create a nurturing environment where the Jewish children learn to pray and worship God and read the Torah as well. So that's really important for the couple to be able to do that with their children. And they have to create a learning environment where children learn the ways of Judaism. How do they live in today's world as a progressive or conservative or orthodox Jew for children right through to adults? And just a little bit of further thought, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. It is believed in Judaism that God and the angels brought together two souls, it's called Bashir, who are intended for each other even before birth. And sometimes in Orthodox Judaism, you have somebody actually match two people to be married. In progressive Judaism, that would never happen. Okay, so even when we're looking at the streams, you have people who are intending for a couple to be married and they may meet each other and be married shortly after. And that word shachan is actually standing for a, a matchmaker. And lastly, on that page, the wedding ceremony is a sacred drama that transforms status, creates a new reality, separates a couple from other people and for each other, while connecting their marriage to every other couple in the Jewish community. Just that is a quote from um, Rabbi uh, Paul Kipps, and it's a really nice one to be able to utilise. And then you've got also there, a Jewish wedding is a decision to work on living with someone in the context of, a com of committed holiness. So God comes into that. It's holy because God created man. It's a process that weaves in family and friends, so community, builds in a system of conscious support, so always supports each other and amplifies loving goodness, kindness. So from Rabbi Goldie Milgram. And Deborah Brand, uh, Band, sorry, a Hebrew manuscript artist, sort of alluded to the fact that the Ketubah is a doorway into the Jewish life together, which both the couple here, the rabbi reads or sings in Hebrew, but also the community hear that as well. And a traditional Jewish wedding is a tapestry woven from many threads. This is quite beautiful. And threads are carried from one generation to another. Jews never forget and they carry with them their history, always. And it forms a chain of Jewish continuity. This is quite lovely. Sages teach us that each marriage ceremony is a reenactment of the marriage between God and the Jewish people that took place at Mount Sinai, the giving of law and that the wedding day is a personal Yom Kippur, atonement, forgiveness of all sins. Marriage is an intricate legal transaction, and that's from Shabbat. I hope that you have really learnt quite a bit to align everything that happens in a Jewish marriage to the beliefs and to streams and to how it has a significance for the individual the couple and the community. We do have a question here and I'm just going to have a look at it. We've been asked to go to step two again. So I will go to step two and just come back on that for this person who's asked. So this is Amelia. So Amelia, that's your step two there. And when you're going through the steps, it's a real reminder to make sure that you're linking always with the symbolism, the beliefs, and how that step actually brings the community into the lives of the Jewish adherents, the shatan and the kala, but also the family. I thank you all very much for being part of this masterclass today. And I would like to wish you all the best with Jewish marriage in your trial exams and your HSC exam. And 
just a reminder, uh, your teachers and your RACs will certainly have access to this masterclass. So it's a, a perfect opportunity to have a really good look um, at the recording of this so that you can gain further information. And I'd be very happy to hear any feedback as well. Thank you everybody for joining me today.